present the obligatory outline and our background is, what is the difference between radiant energy and matter? Is E equals mc squared completely informative? From the Einstein equation, we will roughly derive a simple relationship between microscopic matter, gravity, and space-time. We will derive that relationship again, beginning with only matter and space-time. We will then summarize, present an outlook, and do a little bit of speculation. We will present some credits, and please stick around for some scientific references. It is generally accepted that E equals mc squared, which means energy and matter are considered equivalent, yet no relationship has been presented describing a fundamental difference between matter and radiant energy. Much of science describes the many interactions of matter-matter, energy-matter, energy-energy, but not why matter is matter and energy is not matter. We think gravity is the key difference between matter and radiant energy. Statements that radiant energy is a source of space-time curvature are accepted without observation or experimental evidence. In practice, Entities in the stress energy tensor for gravitational attraction deal with the properties of matter, but never radiant energy. In reality, there is no hard evidence that radiation exhibits gravitational attraction. None. Light following a curved geodesic or suffering a redshift is not the same thing as affecting gravitational attraction. First, we propose only matter exhibits gravitational attraction. Photons do not exert gravitational attraction. It is generally agreed that photons do not exhibit mass. Second, E equals mc squared is a first order approximation, and that's about it. And E equals mc squared does not inform us why matter is very different from radiant energy. It is really best to consider E is equivalent to mc squared, allowing for the strong and weak forces, electromagnetism, and we think gravitational attraction. We will begin with the Einstein equation and simply derive a short relationship describing an important difference between matter and energy. We will then show that a gravitational attraction force affects subatomic particles and is allowed by general relativity with indications of why gravity is so very weak. We presume the Minkowski approximation for space-time and consider a situation in a small lab, the test particle approximation on Earth. We will consider the special case when an electron collides with a positron, a stationary particle. We presume spherical particle symmetry, no angular motion, we ignore electromagnetism and other forces than gravity in our lab. Our example here really keeps things as simple as we possibly can. Here we present a metric tensor in polar coordinates, as you can see here for time and three dimensions, and for our purpose is anti-symmetric with respect to time. t and minus t are both interesting, with the Minkowski metric for the positron being a plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, and the total energy of our system is two times the mass of an electron. The metric tensor for stabbed object is given here, where f sub r and h sub r are two functions of the object radius. We won't drag you through the Christoffel symbols to estimate these functions. That laborious math has already been well done and is well presented in our reference 6. We remind the viewer of the Schwarzschild metric for spherical coordinates and a Minkowski condition, as presented below. We choose polar coordinates for simplicity, with theta and chi set to zero. This derivation is obviously similar to that of Schwarzschild and is found as many sources as our reference 6 here. Under the conditions of low gravity, the Schwarzschild radius, r sub s, is much smaller than the particle radius, obviously true for subatomic particles in the lab, as presented in equation 2. This can be rearranged to the familiar Schwarzschild equation here, as in our equation 3. We are interested in a collision between two small particles, which suffer annihilation. At that moment, both velocities, v, are less than light speed, and m sub t equals twice the mass of an electron. After minor rearrangement, we get the equation 5 here. This is of interest for evaluation of the volume associated with the collision. Remembering that for colliding matter and antimatter, we have a plus time and a negative time. We now propose that at that instant of collision, r sub s is equivalent to r, both being incredibly tiny, time being very short, so that v sub t is equivalent to r sub s r squared. This leads to a simple relationship for a spherical volume 
which is equation 6. Here V, or as we might put it, V sub t, is the space-time volume within the two particles, with m sub t, the mass of both particles, and t is the particle creation in isolation times. Note that r sub s need not be equal to r for matter creation, but should be positive to comply with the Higgs condition, as in our reference 7. We find several important implications from this simple relationship 7. The volume is the negative space-time volume demanded during particle creation. This is demanded because the t squared term is always negative, where t squared is the particle creation annihilation time. The volume becomes positive when m sub t is negative. This occurs during matter and annihilation destruction. We will derive this relationship from a different viewpoint. We propose the relationship between non-relativistic matter and space-time volume as in equation 8, where minus v describes the total volume of space-time incorporated into matter, and m is the total created mass, as in equation 8 above. Most matter is created or annihilated as a particle-antiparticle pair, or during nuclear fusion fission, or beta decay, with very short process times for creation or annihilation. Because matter and antimatter are often involved, the direction of both process times is important. The relationship now includes both of these short times as in equation 9. The total volume, V sub t, incorporated, is proportional to the total mass created. Proportional to some constant, a portion of which is obviously Newton's g, and the constant kappa. We now integrate both sides. The left side for two negative volumes, and the right side integrates for the total mass, and one of the time variables backwards. The relationship now becomes this, as presented in equation 10. We presume the transition times for particle formation annihilation are equivalent, and in addition, interactions between photons traveling in deep space do not suffer time. So the integral with respect to time for a photon is zero. Photons do not contain included volume and do not exhibit gravity. From equation 10, the solution of the volume required for particle pair creation at non-relativistic velocities is equation 11. This situation is similar to the special case for the radius of a black hole, r sub s, the Schwarzschild radius as presented in equation 12. We consider the situation where matter density is much, much less than the Schwarzschild limit. The more general solution for a spherical particle when the velocity is less than light speed applies here, which we present as equation 13. We could separate the traveling distances during particle creation from the travel times, allowing r sub s to be equivalent for r to keep things simple and spherical, as before, as presented in relationship 14. From equation 14 to our relationship only requires allowance for the volume of a sphere to describe the incorporated spacetime. We rearrange these equations 11 and 14 to arrive at equation 15 here, where kappa is obviously now 8 pi over 3. Here, m sub -ot is the created rest mass with the relative masses and the volumes subject to the Lorentz factors. This relationship conforms to the limiting condition becoming zero as time becomes zero. It seems fundamental that we have not found any contrary experiment to our equation 15. We can return to the Einstein equation from our relationship equation 7. One can derive the Einstein equation beginning with the proposition 16. We have related the inclusion of a small volume of space-time in matter with the Einstein equation. We have related the inclusion of a small volume of space-time in matter, and we now understand a material difference exists between matter and radiant energy. And this is another reason why E is equivalent to mc squared, but not identical to mc squared. And we see a very interesting equation 17, where Newton's g is proportional to the volume incorporated over the mass and the time of incorporation squared, equation 17. We can run a quick sample calculation. We could calculate the volume change during particle creation annihilation with Newton's g times squared, using the value for the lifetimes of the virtual w or z particle for a rough example. And we did this in equation 18. This suggests the space-time volume changes for processes during matter creation and annihilation are very tiny, and a radius of around 3 times 10 to the negative 27 centimeters for a proton. That's much, much less than the typical particle cross-section, and just a bit larger than the Planck length. So the particle volume that we propose here 
is within the region of reality. We finally present our unnumbered final equation. We note that if we begin with our equation 7, as presented previously, and derive the Schwarzschild relationship, working back through the Christoffel symbols, we come to this unnumbered equation. This is a more generalized version of the Einstein equation. Note that it's velocity to the fourth power. This not only describes information transfer at light speed, but also describes the volume incorporated into matter during particle annihilation creation. We have introduced two new concepts. A small volume of space-time is incorporated into every matter particle. This disturbance of space-time results in gravitational attraction. We have brought one non-observation to your attention. Photons do not affect gravity. An important difference between radiant energy and matter is the inclusion of a small volume of space-time into matter, which is calculated to be tiny. This space-time volume should not be confused with a black hole. It is not a black hole. Negative geometries from solutions of the Einstein equation are real. The Einstein equation can describe gravity at the subatomic level if we make a slight generalization. The corresponding gravitational attraction from newly created particles should be minuscule. Anti-gravity only occurs during particle annihilation when the associated volume of space-time is released. The smallest quanta of space-time allowed may very well be that volume associated with neutrinos. There really is little need for the concept of gravitons, since anti-gravity is only transient. Sorry, gravity boys. A new field is not required, but r sub s r squared seems consistent with the Higgs field and with space-time being present everywhere, so gravity is simply a perturbation of the highly symmetric space-time. There are some future tasks which uh, come to mind, and that is, can we test if gravity is associated with radiant energy or with other forces? Probably we will find a negative result. Is this negative volume associated with the current bare quark? Possibly. Very interesting. Can we learn something more about gluons? We think gluons are probably do not affect gravitational attraction. Can we learn something more about subatomic collisions? In other words, is there a record of a three particle collision annihilation? We don't think so. Finally, can LIGO detect the destruction of gravity during a supernova event or a nearby gamma ray burst? Maybe but excellent sensitivity is required. This would be a very exciting find. This is some future task for students of gravity. Pretty straightforward questions here. Can one derive analogs of our simple relationship for rotating particles, electromagnetically charged particles, quarks with all the special cases? That would be a real can of worm, a real difficult problem. And objects under extreme gravitational stress. And we offer some speculations. Our infant universe consisting only of radiation and similar energies, like gluons, really did not require or suffer a critical density, rho sub c. And finally, thinking about the nature of the space-time volume included in microscopic particles leads one to speculate that as matter moves through space-time, the space-time substance is exchanged. Space-time cannot be partitioned, and this may be the very limiting factor for particles approaching light speed. What's next? We will next present a video about parameter follies from log transform data. We will run through the problems of data noise and variance which cannot be corrected using log transformation. We will present an example of problems from astrophysics where log transform is used liberally. We will show that data transformation can lead to incorrect results and we will use examples from astrophysics to show where astrophysicists have been led astray by the use of log transform data.